Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for turning up today. And this is, a, this is a real privilege to be able to do this. Uh, my name is Ed Sargent. I'm an instructor for Rasmussen College. I teach multimedia. And I'm from the Bismarck campus. And uh, with me is Alex Fogarty. And she's an instructor from the uh, Fargo campus. And also, we have two of our students here as well. We have Nick and we have Jeff. They're kind of going to be doing the behind the scenes stuff today and uh, helping to put our stuff together. So. What do we have planned today? If we could switch over, please, to machine two and get our PowerPoint up, that'd be great. We're going to talk to you today about visual effects and acting for green screen. And this is something that Alex and I are both very, very passionate about. It's, it's what we love. It's our background. And while we've had different backgrounds, we've worked in different fields, they're both very closely related. They're both interconnected. So I worked in a, a number of different roles in film effects in my past. I'm very proud to have been able to do that. And uh, I worked as a match-moving artist, creating virtual camera movements that replicated the film camera movements. A very, very important process of the, the beginning of the post-production process. And uh, really, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, is the post-production process. Mm -hmm. So we've put a little clip together that we want to show you guys. And uh, we're going to do some live acting, we'll do some green screen acting. And we're going to build, we're going to complete and compile our effects shot today live on stage. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but it should be good. So in addition to working in match moving, I also worked in cloth simulation. I did some things for Harry Potter and some cloth effects. And these were all very different roles, but I never did any of these at the same time. I always did these uh, uh, one thing at a time, different roles. And the important thing is that, ah, here we go. Nice. OK, can we skip to the next one? All right, hey, all right. So the important thing here that's really important to talk about is the fact that I was a very small cog in a really big machine. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today, is the fact that there are so many different roles involved in the making of these shots. And the shots go by so quickly, but they're just tons of people working on them for months on end. They just get revision after revision. So we can see you know, these shots that are put together, we've got tracking, we've got compositing, we've got some 3D, we've got CG elements that are being put in here. And it's a really wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful thing to see these shots being put together and all these different roles that came together to help build these shots. And I think, uh, I think we're ready to move on to Alex's slide. And I'll let Alex take over from here. Sure. And similar to Ed, I was kind of one cog in a really large machine. Um, prior to teaching, I was a, a digital designer for a very long time and I had the great fortune of, of working for Nick Jr. shows. So I worked for Blue's Clues, Wonder Pets, Team Umizoomi. Uh, it was an awesome job. If you can imagine, I worked in the MTV building. I was telling these guys about hearing the TRL, you know, the crowds every morning going into work. Uh, so it was really exciting. But my role was, you know, I was one person. I worked on a team of digital designers. And we would um, create our backgrounds in Photoshop. Um, we would create backgrounds and characters and do all the designing and do all, make all the visuals, everything that you would see. Um, however, we also had green screen. We had a blue screen. So Steve was shot on a, um, for Blue's Clues, was shot on a blue screen. And in Team Umizumi, they would shoot uh, any of the characters that they would use, or live action characters, on green screen. So it was a really, it made the job really interesting because in addition to designing, we also had to take into account the footage that was shot um, and all the action that was going on. So we'd work in Photoshop, bring stills in from the footage. You can see some of the stills here, the, the blue screen and the green screen. Bring them into the backgrounds. But then we would also move into After Effects to test the pans, um, test, see how the sizing was working. Uh, you would use a lot of rules of thumb, like we always knew that Steve's head was kind of the same uh, size as Blue's head. So when you would bring the character in, you would um, use that sizing relationship. You'd work with things like sizing charts. Um, the next one. And invariably, uh, for both shows involving green screen, a lot of the similar issues would come up. So if you're ever designing for a show that's using green screen, 
or, or a production using green screen, some of the things that come up that you're going to deal with are things like perspective. Um, Team Umizumi, the characters were really, really small, so we were often designing, we would just kind of like get down on the ground and say, what, what, did, what does it look like when you're four inches tall? Uh, things like perspective, color relationships. Uh, the footage on the right is, has been color corrected, so the person feels at home in, in the background environment. Your job is to really make it feel seamless, like they belong there. Uh, things like the character's eye lines. Um, Steve very specifically would look at certain props to get the correct answer or the incorrect answer for the kids. Um, things like props. Sometimes if you ever watch the show with your children or still watch it now, you'll see that sometimes like Blue is holding something and then Steve will be holding something. And you have, how, how does that handoff occur? Uh, at one point, the, the prop is an element in Photoshop, but at another point, it goes into footage. So these are all really kind of in, uh, aspects of the position for designing with, uh, with footage that makes it really interesting. I found it really fun because it just made the, the role really dynamic as a designer. Um, so today, we're going to cover kind of the big picture of a whole production. And Ed's going to move on and we're going to talk about kind of the big plan for the day. All right, so what have we got planned for you guys? Well, like I said, we put this shot together, we put an effects shot together from scratch, and we did it as a team. And it took a lot of time, a lot of man hours, but it was a lot of fun. We worked in a lot of different roles. <coughs> and we thought, well, let's give you guys an effects shot that we've completed so far. We'll do the green screen today, and we're going to have some of you guys do the acting and the helping to put that all together and build that. So we're going to need some volunteers later. Think about if you want to volunteer. It's going to yeah. be really fun up here. It's going to be good. <laughs> all right, so. I was on a major Game of Thrones kick. I kind of hit this marathon, <laughs> weekend long hit both series back to back and it was awesome, epic. So I was all into castles and monsters and all this good stuff and I thought, let's try and do this for our effects job. Let's try and mimic a small scale, very small scale version of what you, know, you might see in Game of Thrones. And so if you guys could skip to the next slide. This is where we started. We started by really taking on the role of a concept artist in post-production. And their, their job is to try and, try and build the visuals for this idea, this idea that we had. And I kind of pitched this idea to the guys, and I showed them these visuals as I was doing it. And I just found some castles, lots of ye olde English castles. You know, surprise, surprise. Um, but uh, these were the ones that really inspired me. So we can move on. We can also see this is actually an existing concept sketch for a different production. This wasn't something we did but it sparked our interest. It, it made us inspired, and that's what we wanted. We wanted to get inspired. So guys, if we can move on to the next one. This is really the image that we saw, and we thought, yeah, let's use this. This got us going. Let's use this as an idea for our backdrop, for our scene, and then we can build our concept, concepts from here. So on our next slide, you can see we just started doing some little doodles. We did tons of these. We did tons of pre-production. We did this on paper, just pencil and paper, pen and paper. Because the most important thing that you can do when you're doing your concept work is get back to basics. You want to get away from the software, you want to get away from the tools, and you, you just want to be able to get the ideas straight from your brain, straight up onto paper. Spend five minutes doing a sketch. If it's bad, throw it away. If it's good, keep it as a maybe. So we did tons of this, tons of pre-production. And then directly from pre-production and concept art, you're going to move to storyboarding. And this is, just as the concept art is crucial, so is the storyboarding phase. Because it's something that can be done with quick sketches, um, or it can be done you know, using um, Photoshop elements if you're uncomfortable drawing. Um, but boarding out the entire project is really super important because you're going to combine visuals with dialogue, visuals with camera movements, and you're gonna, it's going to allow you to think through what you're going to do before you start investing anything, before you start uh, filming footage, before you start hiring designers or animators, you're going to work it all out on paper. And that's why storyboarding is so crucial. And so here we have some of the storyboards that we have. Um, we started out from the moon, and then we craned down through the top of the castle. And then a guard is going to walk by, um, and then we'll stop. And a lot of this framing is very, very important. Uh, things like wide shots, um, extreme close-ups, close-up, medium shots. This might be an example of a, of a medium shot. 
Um, so you really want to know your framing because when you go to build something, you just want to build exactly what you need and maybe 20% more. That was kind of the rule of thumb we would use. So in case you need to, you want to start wider out from a pan or, or start a little bit closer and you've got some flexibility there. Um, but you don't want to waste your time, you know, showing the whole castle in every scene. You don't need that. Um, so here are monsters going to burst through the door and then, next slide. Uh, and then he is just extremely intimidating and scary. And wait till you see this character, he looks really great. Um, and he lurches forward and one of you guys, one of you lucky volunteers, are going to be acting here. And you're going to be, the, you're going to be fighting with the monster. Um, so you would be kind of right up there in that corner. Um, and then the character runs off screen. And that's it. It's a really short shot. Um, but we have so much to cover in the different phases of it. That's why we kept it really short. And he runs off, and then that's it. Who's this okay, crazy guy? Okay, this is the really embarrassing part. Uh, I'm going to stand this way so I can pretend it's not there. Why am I dancing around like an ape in my living room? This is really quite embarrassing. Anyway, so the reason I'm showing you guys this is because we're talking about animation. We're talking about the animation process and what the animators do to bring our character to life. So what I'm doing here is uh, acting like an ape. I'm trying to imagine what a scary monster might look like. If you want something to look real, you have to start with a real reference, some real reference footage. And so that's what I did here. I didn't really think I was going to show it, but I, anyway. <laughs> do we go to the next one? All right, so this is our animator's job to bring our character to life. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen here is just a basic rig. It's just a joint system. It's in 3D Studio Max. We use a combination of Max and Maya to do this. And uh, the rigging artist is another position we need to talk about. The rigging artist is responsible for building this rig. That's an entire job description, building just the skeletal structure, making sure that the hands can grasp, the neck can move around, and all that stuff. They'll work closely with the animators. The animators will try and replicate what we have on the left here. Um, and we've given some time constraints here, but we did the best we could. And so if we move on to the next one, this is our final animation. Oh, thank goodness I'm out of the way. Okay, so this is our final animation. This is what we're going to use today as a, as a reference. And the reason we've cut straight to this is because it's very important to understand that when you're acting for green screen, post-production isn't even done. In fact, it might not even have been started. So this, in fact, would be a luxury for our actors to be able to see this, to know what they're going to act against. And in a real production, you might actually have the actors act first, and then the animators do the animation that reacts to the actor's you know, position and stuff, and all that good stuff. So, should we move on? All right, so we need you guys. And we are going to use four volunteers. And one of you is gonna, one of you's going to act. We're going to have two people on lights, and one, pe one person holding up this really crazy looking garbage can. But before that, I just wanted to go over a little of the fundamentals of working with green screen. Are you going to, um, or acting for green screen? Are you going to, you know, think about a lot of this stuff today? No, but it's just important some of the things to consider if you are ever acting on green screen. I know some of you are acting students. Um, okay, so we think about green screen, we think about like The Hobbit and the, these characters and all these really beautiful, beautiful environments. But when you break it down, it's the characters that are really driving the scene. So you're acting and your movement and your momentum is so important, and your emotions. Um, so even though you're working in front of green, you've got to keep that in mind, that, that you're driving the scene as the actor. Because uh, that's the most, the human element is always the most compelling. Um, you want to keep your movements sharp and fluid. You want to feel like, kind of loosen up. You don't ever want to be stiff in front of a green screen like this. You want to just keep, keep moving. Um, and it's, it's going to be important to rehearse. As an actor, you'll get lots of opportunities to do a lot of takes, to have marks on the ground, um, and really kind of get your movements down before you go to final. It'll take a, it'll take a lot of takes. Um, but as your job, as an actor, you're, it's your job to, to imagine the world that you're in, to recreate it in your head, because you don't have it around you. You're not in there to, to smell what the environment looks like, or see or smell what it smells like, or see what it looks like or feel what it's like. So you really have to use, use your brain and use your creativity to envision it in your head of the environment that you're in. And you don't have to do that alone. Just with, like, with reference imagery, you get information. You talk to the director. You have lots of conversations. Um, 
you look at the storyboards. We just saw, you just saw a glimpse of, of what we were going to do today. So you guys already have a sense of where we're going with it. Um, and you just get a sense of depth, like what, what sort of space am I in? Am I confined? Am I against a wall? Or I'm in this really large open field. Uh, so you gather all that information and you, you, pre, you visualize it before you start acting and during. So those are just some kind of general tips to follow. Um, we're going to have you up here. It's going to feel awkward and weird, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so that's um, kind of just the background. But who wants to volunteer? We need four of you guys. All right, so I'm going to choose one from each section. So turquoise sweatshirt. And right there, you <laughs> in the middle. Sorry, middle section. Uh, and oh, we need four. Okay, and we have three sections. Okay, orange hat. <laughs> orange hat, and let's see. We'll make it even. Two guys, two girls. So the guy back there. There you go. <laughs> All right, welcome, welcome, guys. Come on forward. Okay. So we have to figure out first who wants to be our, our actor or actress. Or no, now it's, it's all actors. Um, sorry? Someone speak up. What? Oh, okay. 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 How do we do this? Who wants to act? How do we choose, Ed? Well, does anyone have a preference? Does anyone want to be our actor today? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. And we'll see how much time we have. Maybe we'll switch in and out. Okay. You know? so. so we are going to have you here, and we're going to have two people on lights, just kind of waving rakes. And Let's get our lights turned on. You can be our monster. So you come with me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to stand right over there, and I'll bring you your prop. And you guys, one of you go on one light, and which is the other? Yeah, we'll have one of each. Okay. One of you girls, lovely ladies, right here, okay. and you can come. Are you guys on lights, you're going to feel a little strange because right you're going to have these big rakes that you've got to yield. <laughs> Why are we giving you gardening rakes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we got a big monster. Can you show them the face? <laughs> Our other character is a little bit more advanced than that. So should we just kind of break, break down, go through the yeah. rolls? Okay. So let's start with our lighting, guys. Why are we giving you rakes? And you can see what Nick's kind of showing over there is that we're actually going to have this in a uh, torch lit, so with flames. So our lighting in our 3D scene is going to be very busy. It's going to be moving around. So we need you guys to try and replicate these flames. And so we're giving you these rakes. So you can basically just hold them up, give them lots of movement, move them around and try and break up the light. And you're not really going to see it on the green screen, but you will see it on the actor. It's going to, it's going to break up the light on our actor. And give that kind of torchlit effect. OK, once the guy. Hi. So your job, really, is to watch the animation. In fact, guys, if we could get the PowerPoint number two back on the screen, that would be great. And we can see our, our animation playing through. We can get that playing. So it's, it's your job to try and keep an eye on this animation as it plays. And don't worry too much about it, because there's a lot going on. What we're really interested in is the eye line, just the height of the eye line. So you can see our monster, he's, he's going up and down, up and down. So really, you just want to try and mimic that up and down, up and down. And it's, it's, it's hard to do a monster with a trash can lid, I understand. So, <laughs> so at the same time, I'm going to be watching the animation, and I'm going to be talking to our actor here. I'm going to be telling you, all right, he's swiping. He's swiping at you. So you've got to react to that. Okay. I'm going to tell you that he's lurching at you, so you've got to react to that. And then at the very end of the shot, he's going to come after you. He's going to run after you. And that's basically when you, we want you to run off basically in the direction of this light, to the left of this light here. So kind of next to our lighting expert here. So somewhere around there. And so if we, t if we get the timing right, we'll be able to take this shot, and we'll be able to put it into our final composition. Now, one thing that's really important to talk about is that we're a little, we're a little limited on green screen space today. So, I'm going to have to kind of ask you, you're, you're, you're standing perfect there. You don't really want to come any further forward than here, but your sword can come forward if you want to kind of jab at him, do a couple of swipes. And uh, so you want to keep your forward and backward kind of in these masking tape areas here. You want to try and keep in line 
with this masking tape here, so in this direction. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take a few takes. We'll try this maybe three times if we have time. And we'll watch them back each time. And we'll kind of talk about what went well and what we could improve on. One thing that's really important to talk about is we're a little limited on height. So try to avoid any of these overarm. I'm not a sword fighter, so I don't really know how to describe that. Overarm. <laughs> but uh, We're going to keep you back here. We want to, it's important to keep your shadow off the green screen. So move back here. And it's okay, you're just going to be here for eyeline, so you're just going to keep it up and kind of, you're going to respond to Ed's um, direction okay. of moving it up and down. All right. Does everyone feel comfortable? Yeah. So. <laughs> as comfortable as you can with a trash can lid, it's done on stage. So when we, when we kind of say go, you guys are just going to instantly start with your lights, start moving that around and getting that lighting action going on there. All right, I'm going to stand over here. I'm going to watch the animation play back. We'll have a little downtime. So at the very beginning of the shot, the camera cranes in. So you're just casual. You're just kind of maybe sharpening your sword. You're just kind of trying to act cool. <laughs> and when I shout, monster's coming, that's when you react. Don't cut yourself on another shot. Okay. All right. So I think we're ready to start acting casual, ready to record. Acting casual, acting casual, and the monster bursts in. Monster bursts in, and oh my goodness, what the heck, you've seen this monster. He's roaring at you, he's moving down, so remember up, and we're going to come forward a little bit. You kind of just want to stay there, and just watch his eye line, and I messed up my swipe, so that's my fault. So he's swiping at you, and he's running after you, running off stage. So this is the point where we run off stage. Run off stage. <laughs> all right, that's all right. Okay, it's a little difficult, because all, all we really want to do is just go up and down, that's it. So we don't need to come forward at all, just up and down, just keep an eye on that eye line. And I was completely off with my swiping gesture, so I apologize, that's my fault. Uh, so what, should we try again? And you have to imagine the swipes. You're, he's just there for eye line, so that's where the imagination comes in. Okay, so if we start recording, yeah, and start moving the lights, start jiggling that, get it right up in there. So we're just acting casual, acting casual, acting casual. And oh my goodness, this monster's just come in. What the heck? He's roaring at you. He's up, he's down, he's up, and he's down. He's just roaring at you, roaring at you. He takes a little step forward. What are you going to do? What's he going to do? He swipes at you. He swipes at you again. He's roaring at you. He swipes at you. And he runs after you. Run off stage, run off stage. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> hey, nice one. And know that you can, you can swipe back. Oh, I can swipe back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get angry with it. You won't be hitting anything, but you'll... Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's watch that back. If we could switch to machine one and take a look at that video. Let's see how that turned out. <laughs> Awesome. You can even see our monster. <laughs> okay, your position's good. You can almost see it. You've got to be very careful of, that, of getting back too far, but you're doing good. You just don't want to disappear off the green screen now. That's really important. And so we lost your point, hood a little bit there. <laughs> at a certain point, you can say, OK, I can take this guy. Like, I can do this. So you can be, you know, go through that, that evolution of thought of fear. You're... I think it'd be cooler if he like, ran at me and I ran at him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 well, we do have the preset animation, so just, but you can, <laughs> We're you can work limited. that in. You can work that in. So you can guys, ahead. remember, just get in your grave. Just throw it around. Just try and break up that light as much as you can. Okay, should we try another take? And if you want to kind of mix it up a little bit, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll sort out the contracts later. Okay. That's really good feedback. So, yeah, really big movements, large movements. And, uh, don't hit it, but just try to get a little bit of shadow up there. 
Got it. All right. So we, are we going to get ready to go again? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll let this play through. We'll just kind of get, get ready. In the meantime, you can do your casual. Just kind of, we'll start recording. We'll start recording. And we'll act casual. 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 <laughs> okay. So you're acting casual. And you've got to get ready here. And here comes the monster. He bursts through. He's roaring at you. He's up. He's down. He's up. And he's down. He's roaring at you. He's a little pensive now, but he kind of steps forward and get ready because he's going to swipe at you now. And he swipes at you again. And he swipes at you again. And he's lurching and run off stage. All right. Nice one. Very good. I think we got a natural here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a workout. I do what I can. <laughs> okay, so should we play that one back and see how that looks? This guy's ready for battle, I think. I think so. Okay, so we're coming a little far back, so on the next take, what we're going to want to try and do Keep it a little bit further forward and just kind of try and dance on the spot, you know, just kind of jump up and down and try and, it's, it's kind of your natural tendency to run back when something is coming at you, so I completely get that. So we're just trying to kind of be aware of our constraints at the same time. This is really difficult when you're acting for green screen is because you've got all these other emotions going on at the same time. You're trying to stay in the, you're trying to stay in the mindset, trying to stay focused, and yet you've got to think about your constraints at the same time. Where's your monster coming from? Where's your green screen confines here? So we'll try and get that again, perhaps on another tape. All right. All right, so you're acting casual. You're acting casual. Casual. And he bursts through the door. He bursts through the door, and he's up, and he's down. He's up, and he's down. He's really angry. He's looking at you menacing. What are you going to do? What are you going to do now? He sort of steps forward a little bit, and watch out, because he's going to swipe at you. And he swipes at you again. And he roars, and he swipes at you again. And he runs at you, run off stage. All right, that was really good. All right. Yeah, let's take a look at that and see how that one came out. See, that's good. Your stance is right in the middle now. You've got plenty of room to the left and right with the green screen. So things we're looking for as we watch this, we got a little bit of rake shadow, but I think that's just our lights have been moved a little bit. That's OK. We kept our actor forward. We want to keep him away from the back of the green screen. That's really important. Because if he's too close to the back, his shadow casts all over that green screen. And that's going to mess up our key when we come to actually removing that green area. So what do you guys think? I think that's a keeper? OK. We're good you guys on. think that last one's a keeper? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so should we go with that one? Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you so much, Thank guys. You guys. Thank you to our volunteers. You're awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. We are going to. All right, that was awesome. So when they when they're recording this stuff on stage, they're just going to do take after take after take. And they'll do the same thing. They'll watch it back. Your director's going to watch it back. And you know, you'll have your technical guys there as well looking at the green screen, seeing how everything worked out. Because they've got to get that right. They've got to get that right on the day. Because if they make a mistake, it's really costly to have to come back and do that again and set up the shoot. And oh my goodness, all that expense. So they want to cut that down. So I think we're ready to cut back to uh, machine two with our PowerPoint. OK. So when we were um, thinking about our original concept of, of where we were, the um, whole kind of Game of Thrones inspiration, we knew we were going to go do um, towards like a horror sci-fi direction. Um, and we asked Joe, to Joe, our student Joe over there, to design the character, come up with some concept art. I did some research on monsters, and, and we knew we wanted like a werewolf type look. 
Um, and so this is where we started with this sketch. And it's a very menacing looking character, very muscular, um, clearly uh, very scary, and a lot of large teeth and eyes. So from here, from this sketch, is where you start building. And the next. All right. So once Joe had come up with the feedback, once Joe had come up with the concept, he had to set about modeling it. So he actually went into 3D Studio. Did you model in 3D Studio or Maya, Joe? 3D Studio? OK. And it was his job to take this 2D representation and turn it into something 3D. So what you're actually looking at here is just a low res, low poly version of the final product. But it's so important. So what he would have done here would be to use techniques known as perhaps box modeling, where you're, doing, you're starting with just a simple primitive, maybe a cube or a sphere, and you're extruding portions out. You're adding more detail to that mesh. And you keep extruding it out, adding detail. You've got your reference pictures behind. You've got your reference pictures to the side. And you add in all that detail, and you form the final shape. And that's what we have here. And if we skip forward, we get to talk a little bit about digital sculpting. So traditional poly, poly modeling, like I just talked about, is kind of, uh, you know, it's still very, very important. But times are changing. And we're, we're, our machines are getting faster, and our technology is getting better. So a lot of the times these days, the modeling artist, the 3D modeler, would be expected to be able to use a sculpting package. Here we actually have Mudbox we're using. It allows us to go beyond these low resolution, low poly objects, and allows us to work in really high resolution objects, crazy high. Instead of being on 500 polygons, we're talking a million, two million polygons. And what it allows us to do is actually grab our sculpting tools and sculpt directly onto the surface of the low-res model. So we subdivide it, we subdivide it, we add in all this detail to the mesh. And we can sculpt in, we can see we can, it's so intuitive and so easy to use. And when we layer these up, you can see the final result of the sculpting. And our monster suddenly becomes that much more menacing, just really extreme muscles. So one thing I should mention is that a lot of you know, digital sculptors these days actually come from a traditional background. They may have worked with clay in a past life. That may have been kind of their passion. And then they transition into computer work. And they become concept artists or 3D modelers working in clay, uh, digital clay. So if we want to skip forward again, this is our final monster. There's a couple of errors in the render, but I think it came out pretty good overall. It went from that low resolution to that high resolution over a period of weeks. OK. And once we have our model, um, we need to move from 2D, from 3D to 2D. Uh, so we've got the model, and it needs it needs skin, it needs texture, it needs um, how it's going to look essentially. Um, so that's when we start texturing. Um, we knew we wanted hair or a fur type quality, um, so we got some textures. But first, what you have to do is you have to unwrap the character with UV maps. So we've got these 3D shapes like the legs, the arms, the head, and you literally unwrap them. It would be like taking the orange and taking the peel off and laying it out flat. That's what the imagery on the right is. It's the flattened shapes out. And, that, and these create shapes where you can overlay your textures onto them. And the textures we went with, um, we started with fur. We got some fur references. Um, the image on the right was kind of the look and feel that we wanted, kind of like a rough, coarse hair with some variety within the, the colors from brown to black. Um, so that was kind of the look we were going for. But the texture on the left really provided a more consistent texture to work from. So we we're kind of splitting the difference between the two of them. The texture on the left is going to overlay the UV shapes a little bit easier. Uh, there was just too much variety going on with the one on the right. You see there's a blurry texture in the back um, with the soft focus and sharper in the front. Um, so we really worked for it from inspiration and texture and kind of meet in the middle. And the next slide. And we simply just overlay, um, put the texture onto the UV shapes. And over here you can't see it that well, um, but that's the texture within Maya and adding uh, coloring, a little more shading, darkening it. Um, because that would have been too bright a texture on the character in the environment. Uh, there are also some, uh, some of the individual details of the character, such as nails um, over there and eye sockets on the right. And then... 
Yeah, so then we move on to uh, displacement and normal mapping. And so what Alex was really describing with the UV mapping process would typically be done by the modeler. The modeler would be responsible with communicating with the texture artist. Is this going to work? Is this going to cause any stretching in the texture? Is this going to be problematic? And so they work together as a team to do that, and the texturing artist would take over, which is Alex's role here. Displacement and normal maps, what the heck are we looking at here? Well, we started off with this low resolution, this low resolution model. We took it into Mudbox, a completely different package, and we used a really high resolution technique to get all that detail in. But we're still limited in our, in our typical 3D packages. We can't bring that high <coughs> resolution stuff and bring it back into our traditional 3D package. So we have to get creative. And so one of the techniques that's very kind of vogue right now, it's just in fashion, is to talk about displacement and normal mapping. You'll see a lot of normal mapping in video games. Most of the video games you're playing these days, PS3, Xbox, they're using normal mapping to trick you into thinking there's more detail in that model than there really is. They're really lower polygon resolution than, than you think they are. So the displacement map on the left allows us to capture that detail from our high resolution software. And when we render out in our, in our low resolution software, and rendering is essentially taking our 3D scene and getting the final result. All the lighting is applied, everything looks great and peachy. And so we bring across that detail with the displacement map. And the normal map is just a lighting trick. Again, we're trying to get that detail in there. We're trying to fool you guys into thinking that's really a much higher resolution model than it actually is. And if we uh, move forward. Ambient occlusion mapping. It's used a lot in video games as well. It's used a lot in film. Ambient occlusion mapping, again, is the same thing. We have to try and capture detail in the shadows of this high resolution monster and put it into a map. We're still using our UV layout. And then we can wrap this onto our final model. If we go to the next one. It's a little hard to see, but this is our final model with all of those different texture maps in place. And to render out these beauty passes that we call them, this will be the job typically of our rendering artists, maybe our lighting artists. This takes time. This takes a long time to render out these images. And you consider that we spent maybe a couple of hundred hours on this project. A lot of that, in between that, we were rendering. We were limited on CPU time. So we had to get these beauty passes rendered out to, to show you guys the final model here. And I think we can skip forward. All right. So texturing. What Alex was talking about here was the, the, the traditional method of texturing in Photoshop. Take our 2D UV map, bring it into Photoshop, and then we paint it. Use reference images, fur, etc. Again, Mudbox can help us here. As well as being able to sculpt onto the surface of this object, we can paint onto it as well. Again, this is really in more recent years that this technology has become possible, just because of uh, just advances in the technology, advances in, in the hardware as well. You can see I can paint onto the surface of this object directly on top of my sculpting. And when I move it around, you can see everything lines up perfectly. Really easy, incredibly intuitive. It took me a couple of minutes. That could take me a couple of hours if I was doing it using traditional techniques. We bring Mudbox here, we've got our final model, and we did some, some extra painting on there to come up with our final monster. And what you're looking at here are our set, <coughs> essentially our back wall. We did the same thing, we modeled all of these different objects for this. And again, we have our modeling artists going crazy, trying to get all this done while the green screen's being shot, while the acting's being shot. It's all happening at the same time. You can see I layered up those textures and came up with the final result. We did this for all of our geometry, for the whole scene. So you can start to see why this stuff takes so long to do. And this is just a shot of those UV maps when they're complete, what this looks like when we get it out of Mudbox, and again with the displacement mapping. So you can see how the process is quite you know, you're structured, and you just keep going through. And you'll assign these tasks among the team. You'll have several modelers. You'll have several texturing artists, several animators, several riggers. They'll all work on these different assigned tasks, and they'll be responsible to report to their leads, their team leads, their supervisors. This is our final render of our back wall. Nice. <laughs> We're done. OK, so this is, this is the final scene. You can see Alex did all this great texturing on the floor there. It's a little hard to see, but again, we use displacement mapping to kind of disrupt the feeling of that floor and try and get that detail in there. We did some lighting tests, 
and you can kind of see we've got some gray geometry that shouldn't really be there off to the side. We got a little ambitious at one point and thought we'd make the zoom really big, but then we had to scale it right back because of time. Okay, and these are examples of the background, like what world are we in? What's behind the castle? What's going on? Um, because we've got our guard, they're guarding the castle that you'll see later. Um, but then we also have a world around it where the monster is from. So my job as a background designer, or in this case, say in a large production, might be a matte painter or matte designer, um, was, is to create a world that doesn't exist. Uh, and at this phase, we were deciding, okay, what time of day is it? We did some color exploration. We did exploration of atmosphere. Did we want it super spooky? Did we want a, a, a day shot? Did we want something more at dusk? And these types of versions of um, different passes of, of really looking at what can we do here. You don't start out with one idea and just go with that directly. You're going to explore lots of options because you don't want you know, a year into a production being like, oh, what if we had done it like this? You want to, you want to be able to say, you know what, we tried that, we hated it. Or, you know, it was okay, but it just didn't work for this. Um, so having lots of versions and passes of things is very, very common. Uh, work we would do on a job, I mean, it's not just two or three revisions. We would do 15, 20, and you're working with an art director as a designer, and it's, it's, you have to get their approval. They're called daily approvals. And you show your work every day, and it's hard. You're going you're gonna to get you know, kudos and say, hey, great job, but no, that's not it. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. Until you get it right. Um, you have to build a pretty thick skin, actually. Right? <laughs> well, through, the, through the critique process, you have to be a little resilient. Yes. Yeah, you really have to kind of say, just get zen about it and say, okay. Um, and you think in your head, all right, when it's my, when my production, I'm going to do it this way. And you just uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so yeah, so this is just a couple of different version of passes that we did for this. You know, it's one shot, so we just had a, a few different color passes to see the mood that we wanted to project. And we, we weren't sure, but you know what? We saw the blue one, um, very monochromatic, and said, let's, let's go with that. It's going to be a night scene. All right. Do you want me to turn off these back lights? That might help, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. So with our, with our map painting done, Alex took care of our map painting again, an entire job description, map painting artist. We had to start thinking about how this stuff was going to come together, how it was going to look. We had to start thinking about lighting. We move on to our lighting artists. And it's their job, just like it sounds, to light the scene. It's very specialist, takes a key knife of detail, and uh, you know, kind of good color response. You can see that we have kind of these two keys in our scene, which are these two torches, and that's what our lighting experts are doing today with the rakes and kind of trying to break up that light. That's what we were trying to mimic. So this lighting setup wasn't an accident. We had this all in our minds. We had this all planned. We knew we had to try and mimic this lighting setup as best we could. We have a little bit of a rim light on the monster coming from the moon, but that was so subtle we thought, you know what, we can get away without doing that today. So if we advance forward, what's, what are we looking at here? Well. Everything you do, like I said, has to be as realistic as you can get it for this shot. If you want something to look realistic, you have to start with a realistic reference. So you'll often see, just like I did with the animation, started doing the animation, we did the same thing with lighting. We just put a candle in my bathroom, put these little wax crayons up, and observe the light. What happens? How does this light move around? Look how these shadows are dancing around, moving around. The light intensity is moving in and out, in and out, in and out. So we had to get creative, and we had to use noise algorithms on the intensity of the light to bounce it up and down, and also move the lights around in the scene very, very fast to try and replicate that candle flicker. All right, and then we move on to one of the last stages in the production process, compositing. The compositing artist, it's such an important role. So what our, what's happening here is we're actually starting to see this shot being put together in a compositing package, in this case, After Effects. And what we're looking at here is Alex's background being put in. If we skip forward to the next one. I think that's good. You can see a camera move here. That camera move was taken directly from our 3D software. We took that data, brought it into our 2D software, and started overlaying our renders. Alex's map painting, the 3D stuff. This is all done in separate passes. We keep everything separate, including our monster pass. We separate everything out. 
multiple passes of rendering, shadows, specular highlights, those little shiny parts of your objects, the diffuse maps, which are our, our color textures, the monster, the backgrounds, everything is rendered in multiple passes. The compositing artist puts it all together. Nice. So why are we keeping everything separate? Why do we do that? Why not just slap it all together and just render it all out in one go? Separating out these elements like this gives the compositing artist the complete control to tweak each and every one of these layers. It's their job to clean up the final shot. So in addition to adding in 3D, we also added in 2D elements as well, found footage. This stuff's available all over the net. If you ever want to try this kind of stuff, there's royalty-free stuff to use. You can get it everywhere. We needed fire effects for our torches. We needed smoke effects to put in front of the scene to try and give it a little bit of an atmosphere as well. We could have done this in 3D. We could have used particle effects, dynamic simulation, and all that good stuff. It would have taken forever and probably wouldn't have looked as good. If you have real reference, use it. Just use a Luma key, get rid of that, get rid of that black background, insto smoke, insto fire. Can we move on to the next one. Hey, well, we also needed more acting. We needed more talent. Um, when we first started thinking about the scene, we thought, okay, we want to, we want it to be a castle that is being guarded. Um, luckily, we had my student Ben in the in the lab. We had the, the green screen up. I ran out to Party City, got the hat. We grabbed a Rasmussen tablecloth, wrapped it around him, so let's do this. Um, you know, we just kind of thought it out, got the pieces that we need, Nick helped shoot it, um, and then just got the footage off to Ed very quickly, just threw it up on, on Dropbox and started moving with it. Um, so while it's important to think through um, the steps, you don't want to get paralyzed. You, you know what, we've got all our resources, we've got this, let's just do it, let's do some, some takes on it and see how it goes. Um, I was a little worried about the, the cloak, you know, but it wound up not being an issue with the, where it turns white. Uh, you know, I could have spent three days looking for the perfect thing to wrap him in, but uh, this worked just as fine. It's such a quick shot that you don't want to obsess over things that are really, really, that are going to go really quickly where the camera doesn't hold on. If something's blurry in the background, but you're just panning down past it, um, it's not as important as something that you're holding on for five minutes, a really, really crucial scene. So we knew this was going to be a quick thing that we just panned down, so we did it really quickly. And you'll see Ben in the shot right here. So we put all these different elements together. We started compiling them together. Building them into the shot, you can see Ben just kind of disappearing. <laughs> it's just a little added touch. And you see all these little intricacies, and you don't realize when you're watching a movie that some guy probably spent several weeks doing that little bit of paper that just kind of bounces up and down when the helicopter takes off. The guy was responsible for that little sheet of paper. So there's so much work that goes into this stuff. So we put this composite together, and by the time we were getting ready to finish this project, like I said, a couple of hundred hours between us on this project, somewhere in the region of 10,000 files created for 33 seconds of footage. That's pretty modest for an effects shot, actually, but my hard drive's full. So you can see we brought it all together, we can see the final piece. Can we move on to the next one? All right. That last shot was complete almost, but it looked pretty horrible. Now we see the final shot. Again, this is our compositing artist. Came in here, color corrected each and every one of these different layers so everything started to match. Pull it all together. All right. So yeah, you can see our final monster looking pretty angry with all that high-res detail brought in on those displacement maps, those normal maps, his shadows in there as well. And again, you know, we're working on time constraints, and that's the same thing that's going to happen in a real life project. One of the first things I learned when I started working in effects was you've got to make it look just good enough, because we're on a time budget here, guys. You can't spend ages obsessing over your monster's ears and well, they just should go off in this direction or this direction. you just got to get it done. Because your team supervisors are coming down on you. You've got a deadline to meet. Keep going, keep going. We're going to do dailies tomorrow. We want to see something ready. And so by this time, we had our final shot complete. And I think we're ready to move on and talk a little bit about what these guys are doing here today. They've been busy behind the scenes doing stuff. They've been taking on the role of the compositing artist. This is our student, Mike. He volunteered to be a little old lady for this test. 
So we shot this in one of our labs. And really, this video is to show you the compositing process. It's a process known as chroma keying. We're, we're affecting the chrominance. We're removing that green from the green screen. This is what Joe's been doing now. We start off by creating a mask. We want to get rid of as much of the useless green screen that we don't need to worry about as possible. That's really, really important. We don't need to worry about those wrinkles if our character isn't even over there. So let's make life easy on ourselves. And when you can see that mask has been put on there, all we need to worry about now is getting rid of that little bit of green around our character. That's all we need to worry about. So once we've got that good, the next process you can see up here is the process in After Effects. It's a filter called or a plugin known as Keylight. And that takes care of the chroma key process. And Keylight's really cool because you can pick the color of your screen. You just color pick it, kind of a medium green. It instantly starts going to work to get rid of that green for us. And we're building here what's known as a mask. And that allows us to, where the green was, we'll replace it with black, get rid of all that. That becomes invisible. Where the character is, we need that white. We need to be able to see that character. And so we've got to try and clean up these edges, and it's a process of tweaking the sliders, getting the filters just right. It's a very kind of intricate process. You can see our complete mask here after that process is done. We can test it on a red background, make sure we're happy with it. Our little old lady's even more confused now. <laughs> All right, we're ready to bring it into our shot. So we thought, well, let's just test it in the scene. So we move it into place, move it around, get our color correction going, put a few filters on there to try and get it to blend in. And suddenly after our monsters come roaring through, we have a little confused lady who doesn't quite know where she's doing in the shot, you know. So that's the chroma key process. And again, that's the job of the compositing artist. And you might have somebody working in just on chroma keying alone. Somebody else could be color correcting it. You never know. It all depends on the project. And I think, I think we're ready to see our final shot. So if we could maybe... If we could switch over to machine one. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thanks, Alex. Yep. All dance to you, Pouse! Oh. <laughs> that was a practice. Here comes the real one. Okay. <laughs> Little suspense here, just building up the moment. <laughs> Him. And that's our final shot. <laughs> so, that's our final shot, all put together. You want to see it again? <laughs> see it one more time? Can we play it again, guys? Yep. You want to try and full screen it this time? You can just double click on the video.
get him. So do we have any questions? Can't see. Anyone curious about the process? Oh. Can you talk a little bit about lighting the green screen, just like on a simple, basic level? That's a really good, that's a really good point, actually. Um, do you want to take this? Okay. Try to get out of it. <laughs> um, so there's two things we're concerned about. You can't just light everything and expect everything to work. You've got to pay close attention to keeping this background, this green screen, as green as possible. We don't want any kind of interacting shadows coming in there. We don't want any extreme contrast with the little folds and the creases. We've got to try and get that as smooth as possible. So we use dedicated lights just for the green screen. And we keep that separate as much as we can from the rest of the lighting. And then we come forward here, and where our actor is going to be, we try and force our lighting and control our lighting just on the actor. We try and make sure that our actor isn't too close to the back of the green screen because we don't want those shadows there. We don't want any of those shadows playing in. Because when Joe's doing the chroma key process, if you have all these horrible shadows coming in, then you've got more color variation. You've got dark greens versus light greens, and that makes it much harder to chroma key out. So if they make a mistake during the lighting process and during the setup for this shot, it could be really time consuming for the compositing artist to have to get rid of all those shadows and rotate them out, mask them out. The uh, mapping, taking the uh, texture maps and moving them into your, uh, your final images, you said there, there, was, there was a reason you couldn't, you couldn't just take those high res images and drag them in. Is that just a function of, uh, of processing? Yeah, and that's that's a really good point. It's um, it's a little frustrating at the minute because our software and our machine power just isn't there to take these really high resolution meshes. And if you're talking film production, you might have four million polygons on this high resolution mesh. And if we were to put that on top of our skeleton structure, just to import that into the scene, it would probably crash our 3D software. So we use two very different pieces of software. And the sculpting software, that's really all it does, it's just sculpting. There's no animation, there's no real lighting. And so we have to figure out, how do we work with this high resolution detail in software which is designed to do everything, it's designed to light, it's designed to render, it's designed to animate. So we can't just take that really high resolution model, put it on a rig. If the animators try to test that, it would just be so slow. And they're looking to get real time feedback, so they work as low resolution as possible. And when the render, render artists set it up to render, they bring those maps in to carry that detail across. What actually happens at render time is, as soon as you hit render, the mesh suddenly gets subdivided. It gets made very smooth, lots and lots of detail, and it applies those maps. So it happens after the fact. Everyone's finished with the scene, it takes care of it in the background. And it's just, um, it's just kind of the workflow right now, and it's, it's one of the reasons we're not seeing high resolution sculpts like that in video games, because video, you know, a video games console couldn't handle that many polygons. So they use maps to kind of trick the process as an interim. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. Thank you for our volunteers. Yeah. Thank you to our students. Thanks to these guys. Thanks to Alex. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun, and I think yeah. really glad it worked out. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Great, it's great. program again at freetv.org on community access channel 12 or order a copy info at freetv.org or 258-8767